Dr. Francis Collin is, is the 16th director of the United States National Institutes of Health. I will add this, it's not on his resume, but he was also my genetics professor when I was in medical school. I'm very proud of that. Uh, he's got remarkable intellect. He's got a really introspective mind. Some of my funnest and I think most meaningful conversations have been with you. I appreciate it. you're here to talk about the promise and the peril of human cell and gene therapy research. Welcome, thank you. Thank you. A more skillful moderator you will not find in any setting uh, than Dr. Gupta. So that's been wonderful to be able to see how he's drawn out of all of these panels uh, really interesting information, whether they intended to give it up or not. <laughs> Well, I'm really pleased to have a chance to speak to you, although it is a long day, and some of you may feeling a little bit glazed over at this point. I'll try not to glaze you any further. But I did want to give a brief sort of 20-minute overview from a perspective uh, of the director of the NIH, but I, I will also make this kind of personal, about the topic here, the promise and the peril of biotechnology research, because I think that's what we have been here to talk about. You've heard a lot of exciting science in the course of the last two days. You've also heard some concerns about exactly where are the boundaries and who's deciding whether those boundaries are going to be adhered to or not. And I want to walk you through some personal thoughts about that. So the promise, you've heard about it all day today. Welcome to the golden age of cell and gene therapy, whether it's uh, using this to uh, do something about HIV, uh, the first person who was injected with in vivo gene editing uh, for Hunter's uh, syndrome, CRISPR gene editing tested in a person, and even FDA bringing approval for the first gene therapy. And I'm going to be mixing gene editing and gene therapy all together because, as was said a few minutes ago, they're all kind of blurry at this point. We're talking about approaches to treatment that involve genes. But then there are the perils. I'm fond of Albert Schweitzer's quote, we, are, we must not allow our technology to exceed our humanity. Designer babies, as that's where we're heading. Human genome editing shouldn't be used for enhancement yet. Uh, you can see the headlines. So are we on a difficult place here? Are we in a collision course? Or is this something which, with thoughtful adherence to traditional ethical principles, uh, we can find our way forward? I'm going to argue we're probably going to be able to do that, but it's going to take full engagement of all the stakeholders, including lots of people in this room. Just stepping back a minute, a lot of this comes out of the Human Genome Project and the success of that enterprise that you see here diagrammed in a wild 13-year period that I had the privilege of being deeply engaged in. But that in itself was built upon the fact that DNA's double helical structure was discovered back in 1953, and exactly 50 years later then led to the first reference sequence of the human genome, all those three billion letters of our DNA instruction book. And I guess I can't help but point out, we are now exactly 15 years after that. DNA Day, which we all celebrate on April 25th, was just the day before yesterday. So uh, you were here for uh, DNA Day, and uh, a lot of this conversation would not have been possible without all the things that we've learned about the genome and our ways that we can now begin to use that in exciting therapeutic opportunities. The way in which that has played out since the sequencing of the human genome has involved a wide array of fascinating and wonderful science done by individual investigators. It's also involved a fair number of large-scale projects uh, carried out over international uh, stages, but many of them supported by the NIH. I won't even go through all of the acronyms here, but every one of these is a project that has enhanced our understanding of how the genome actually functions or in some cases, how the genomes of other organisms like our microbes uh, function with us as we are now thinking of ourselves as a super organism. And there's much more to come in that space. And I think one of the wonderful democratizing aspects of this is these are all projects where the data is made immediately accessible to anybody who has an internet connection to begin to build upon the information that we all need to really understand how our genomes function. The cost of sequencing a human genome has plummeted in the course of the last 15 or 20 years. This diagram shows you on a log scale that the cost of sequencing a complete human genome has dropped faster than Moore's Law for computers. We're down now to a less than $1,000. This uh, slide needs to be updated, which is pretty amazing when you think that in September 2001, uh, when we first started really paying attention, it cost about $100 million. 
This makes it possible then to contemplate sequencing very large numbers of genomes. The Broad Institute uh, just two days ago on DNA Day announced that they had just finished sequencing their 100,000th human genome. Think of that, 100,000 genomes when we were so proud 15 years ago that we did one. And we in the United States are about to launch a program called All of Us, which is going to enroll one million Americans in a prospective uh, longitudinal cohort study, which ultimately will result in the sequencing of all of their genomes, as well as collecting a vast amount of environmental exposure data and their electronic health records, all as our full partners in an effort that is going to be profoundly significant in terms of teaching us about how to prevent and how to treat disease. So all those things coming very quickly, and again, technology is a major driver. The results of having all of this information about the genome has made it possible to discover the causes of disorders that previously we could describe and you could read about in books like Mendelian Inheritance in Man, but which we now know precisely what gene is involved and what spelling problem has occurred, and that is now up to 6,000, a little over that, conditions, most of them quite rare and all of them desperately in need of some kind of intervention, because these are mostly illnesses that affect children and for which, at the present time, there's only treatment for a very small number of them. Uh, to be specific, only about 500 of these have any form of therapy, which is why we can get so excited then about the advances that we've been talking about. Because these are all diseases of DNA misspellings. If we could figure out how with CRISPR-Cas or other forms of gene editing, in vivo to be able to deliver the appropriate uh, apparatus to the appropriate tissue, all of these would be within reach. And that would be an approach that you could scale to thousands of diseases, as opposed to having to figure out how each one of them is involved in a biochemical pathway and develop a small molecule drug therapy, which might take you 20 or 30 years. And of course, as we think about which of those diseases we would like to see attended to, I was delighted at uh, the panel that just was here talking so prominently about sickle cell disease, because it's time to find a cure for the first molecular disease, and that is sickle cell disease. The disease described in 1910, the inheritance shown in 1949 to be recessive, the genetic basis by figuring out the protein abnormality in 1957. Uh, genes cloned in 1980, uh, a drug, but not a drug that is as successful as you would like, uh, proved in 1998. Not much since then. Bone marrow transplants are curative, but few patients actually have a match. And so now, the excitement, both gene transfer and CRISPR-Cas gene editing, putting forward the opportunity in the next few years, and from what I heard uh, at this table a little bit ago, maybe a very short number of years, we will see the success of a cure for the first molecular disease. And I use the word cure intentionally in this case. We won't be able to reverse the organ damage that patients have already sustained, but as we get good at this increasingly, we ought to be able to apply this to younger individuals, not just those who've already gone through many decades of sickle cell disease. This is going to be, I think, one of the more dramatic positive moments uh, of the next couple of years, and sort of watch for this, because we've waited a long time to be able to claim that this was going to be possible. And of course, gene editing is rapidly becoming ubiquitous. You heard about that in an elegant panel just before this. The ease and the precision of technology makes it possible to do things, and there are multiple applications to basic science. Every lab, including mine, is using this for all kinds of experiments that used to take us a long time to do. And for somatic cell gene therapy, as for sickle cell disease, this is something to be really excited about and where I would not argue the ethical challenges are particularly complex. But are we also talking about modifying the human germline, and if so, for what purpose and in what way? And then what about this thing called gene drives? Well, human germline modification is certainly something we've been talking about uh, as long as I've been involved in genetics research. Ever since recombinant DNA came along in 1973, uh, we've had conversations about the designer baby scenario and could you, in fact, utilize these tools to change the DNA of an offspring? But those are now less hypothetical and perhaps more practical because CRISPR-Cas is so darned efficient. And of course, it's already been possible to utilize this in editing of human embryos, although those were not for purposes of reproduction, but simply to learn something about the early stages of development over the first few days. But do we want to, 
across the world embrace the idea of utilizing this approach uh, to produce genomes of future offspring that actually would not have happened uh, according to natural phenomena. Is there justification to do this? Well, it'd be a bit of a long discussion, but it's actually fairly difficult for me to identify a circumstance where one would justify using a highly unproven approach with gene editing where you don't know exactly about the off-target effects. Because if you're talking about trying to prevent uh, a disease that's inherited in a recessive fashion, we already have the opportunities with pre-implantation genetic diagnosis uh, to be able to approach that in a fashion that's very well worked out. Is there justification to apply this for enhancement? My personal view, not now. We do not have sufficient evidence to know about safety. So if you were actually planning to modify the genome of an individual who's not there giving their consent, you would want to be very sure that you were not creating harms that you didn't appreciate. And those might be off-target events where you actually hit another place you didn't mean to and wouldn't know until later. Or they might be on-target events where you've modified a gene that you thought was going to be beneficial, but our knowledge of biology is not that uh, sophisticated. You might surprise yourself. And of course, having that experience, that individual is not only affected, but their offspring are as well. So purely for safety, I think distinguished bodies like the National Academy of Sciences uh, meeting jointly with the UK and with China felt that for enhancement, this was simply off the table. And I would say more than that, philosophical and theological concerns deserve a great deal of thought here. We're talking about modifying the basic nature of humanity. If you have a sense that we are special creatures, if there's something about the image of God that means something to you, this is potentially crossing a line into territory that we have not previously thought we should go and should only be undertaken with a great deal of thought, even if we had the safety concerns in hand. And then finally, there's the equity concern. If we figure out how to do this and it's complicated and sophisticated and it takes a lot of resources, who will have access and who will not, and we, will we further increase the distance between the haves and the have-nots. Another place, of course, to worry about, but also potentially to celebrate in terms of applications of gene editing, is this whole thing about a gene drive. And this is a complicated strategy, which actually the first time I heard about it seemed like that can't be right because it violates all the rules of inheritance that Gregor Mendel told us about. Uh, 150 years ago, namely that you could, in fact, modify a certain number of the species of, of a particular uh, group that's uh, replicating, and it would ultimately become true of every member of that species, not in a fashion that followed simple dominant inheritance. I won't go through the mechanics because of time, but let's just be said that CRISPR does make this possible. And so, for instance, for mosquitoes, which is the uh, target that many people have talked about, by introducing a modified mosquito genome into a modest number of a particular species, over the course of only six or seven generations, all of those mosquitoes would then carry that variation. If that made them no longer capable of transmitting malaria, that sounds like a pretty good thing. If it made them sterile so they could no longer reproduce and mosquitoes died out altogether, that might be a good thing, but what would be the consequences uh, to the rest of the ecology? Mosquitoes are, after all, food for bats and birds of other sorts. What would we have done that we would later regret? And could you take this back when you decided you didn't like the outcome? Maybe not. So there's a big debate about this, even as it is an enormously powerful opportunity to think about, especially for a terrible disease like malaria. I think we're going to have to, in this circumstance, do what we have always done, which is to basically agree upon what are our fundamental ethical principles. And ethicists have worked these out over many decades, and they're remarkably shared regardless of your particular religious persuasion or non-religious persuasion, such things as respect for persons such things as beneficence, that we are about trying to do good and not to do harm, such things as justice, that benefits and burdens should be justly distributed. And those are three of maybe the major set of principles that we ought to think about as we wrestle with whether there are boundaries here and how to justify what we're going to do in terms of benefits versus harms. And maybe it would be uh, useful in that regard to think about a way, uh, as we're wrestling with these issues, about how do we focus on the areas most in need of attention. So let me try this out on you. What you see here is a graph that I'm going to fill in here. On the, on the x-axis 
is a level of acceptability of a particular kind of biotechnology or scientific intervention, anywhere from admirable to unacceptable. On the y-axis is time on a log scale, now up to never. Now, sometimes when we have these discussions about ethical uh, interventions, immediately people try to make a distinction between therapy and enhancement. And I'm going to try to argue that that's the wrong tr way to try to draw a line. Because all of you are enhanced biologically, whether you know it or not. You had a vaccination sometime in your life. Well, that actually caused DNA in some of your immune cells to rearrange. You have had not just an improvement of some vague sort, you've had a biological transformation of your B cells. So you are enhanced. And we not only think that's acceptable, we think that's admirable. So let me walk you through a few things here. And some of them are a little silly. Hair coloring, OK. That's an enhancement. That means you're not looking the way you were born. OK, we probably consider that acceptable most of the time. Music lessons. <laughs> That actually, if you start early, we can see when we scan your brain that your brain has been substantially anatomically changed by intense musical training. You have been really enhanced by those piano lessons. And yet, I guess unless they turned out really badly, that's admirable. Cosmetic surgery, well, okay, uh, getting a little further to the right here, but certainly something available now. Exercise, well, yeah, that's an enhancement. I hope I'm enhanced by those workouts I do every two or three days, because they certainly take a lot of energy, and hopefully they're making me healthier. Fluoridated water, sure, that's an enhancement of all of us. It's helped us, uh, if you have access to it, uh, with dental health. Immunizations, as I just started out saying, an admirable biological enhancement. So again, enhancement's not bad, it's sort of the application of it. Prayer, okay, I'm gonna call that admirable, and I'm gonna call that a potential enhancement as well. It fits on the list. Now, sometimes uh, it gets a little bit more awkward. Viagra here, uh, OK, uh, that's certainly an enhancement. Uh, whether you call it acceptable or questionable, it depends on probably what sex you are and how old you are. <laughs> and then sometimes it depends on the application. So a child with attention deficit disorder who's benefited uh, by Ritalin, that's a good thing. If you have a kid of that sort, this has turned out to be pretty beneficial. But the very same intervention which is also an enhancement, which is widely now adopted by college students, where Ritalin is very much a black market substance, I would say that's unacceptable. And yet, you get it? It isn't just the thing, it's how you use it. And there's more examples of that. If you have a kidney failure, you're anemic, you need erythropoietin to keep your blood count up, otherwise you're going to be exhausted and fatigued all the time, that's a good thing. If you're an athlete and you're getting injected with erythropoietin, that's called doping. That's unacceptable. Same substance, different application. Enhancements, to be sure, in both cases. Drugs to treat morbid obesity. Well, we don't have them yet, but I wouldn't be surprised if we have them. For morbid obesity, which is life-threatening, that's probably a good thing. But if it's something where we will then take off target and begin to try to help normal people stay thin without following any of the other regulations and dietary restrictions, maybe that's not so good. Keeping going. Individualized preventive medicine. Well, I would say that's admirable, and it's getting there. And perhaps with things like this Million Strong study I mentioned, we will be there for the general public in another decade. We're not there at the present time. Let's get tricky here. Sex selection. OK, I think most of us would agree that sex selection gets into a space that's kind of questionable. But if you could do it by sorting sperm, so there's no question here about terminating a pregnancy, maybe it is at least in the questionable zone. Again, these are my own personal views. If you get to selection by sorting embryos, using PGT, for instance, to choose the sex of your offspring, uh, then you really are beginning to wonder, wait a minute, what are we doing here? Sex is not a disease. Sex selection by pregnancy termination, even further down the, the zone of unacceptability. But those are all feasible at the present time. Cell therapy. If you're going to cure stage four cancer, well, that's got to be a good thing. So we'll put that there, and we're getting there. Cell therapy to treat type 1 diabetes. I think we're on the path there with artificial pancreas that you could make uh, from a cell therapy approach. We heard this morning about cell therapy to treat autism. This question about making transplantable organs, one approach is to create human-animal chimeras where you basically build your own heart in a pig. 
But then when you do that, which other of your cells ended up in that pig? And does that pig have some of your brain cells as well? And what have we created there in terms of an animal that might have special properties that is way outside of what would have happened in nature? Maybe we better think hard about that. Whereas if we could build transplantable organs in a dish from your own skin cells, probably much more acceptable and potentially possible in a 10-year period. We just talked about gene editing to cure sickle cell disease. Admirable, let's do it. Gene editing to cure thousands of rare diseases. All of those that are in my diagram, if we can figure out how to do that, you bet, let's do it. I don't see the ethical challenges there, that's admirable. But gene editing of human embryos to prevent disease, uh, that seems to cross a line. And to enhance performance really crosses of the line, as I tried to argue a little bit ago. Extension of lifespan, we had a panel about uh, that uh, earlier today, to 120 years. Um, I think most people would say that seems like it's a good thing as long as your health span is there too. How about 500 years? We had some debate in the, in the panel the, today about who really wanted to go there. Uh, so I'm just gonna call it questionable. Downloading human consciousness to a computer, um, a little debate there too. And okay, never forgetting, that sounds pretty good, but I don't know if we'll figure out how to do it. Uh, never sleeping, that sort of feels like what you've been doing at this meeting, but maybe you don't want to be able to <laughs> do it the whole time. And then finally, an end to poverty worldwide. I wish that was not in the never zone. Uh, Jesus said in John 12, 8, the poor will always be with you, but he also said it's your obligation to take care of them. And of course, healthcare for everyone. I hope that's not never. So I'd love to redo this slide later and get rid of those particular designations if we could worldwide figure out how to do it. So basically, I hope you could see there, one of the things I hope we could pay attention to then is where are the areas that are actually practical where we ought to focus our attention, bioethics, and not spend too much time on the impractical ones. The concerns about playing God are not exactly new. They go back to recombinant DNA, to genetic engineering, to cloning, remember that, playing God with human cloning, to the Human Genome Project, which has its own ethical questions, synthetic biology, genome editing, where we are right now, and even do-it-yourself uh, gene editing, all of which does raise this question about what's the connection uh, with our faith perspective and the wonderful gift I was given last night, that picture from the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel is not supposed to have a nucleic acid connecting uh, the fingers here, but many people are beginning to think maybe uh, that's where we're going. The scientific community is paying attention. I hope you've got a sense of this, that scientists are not out there just running forward without paying attention to the p potential here of what might happen as a result of these advances. But at the same time, uh, the advances are happening with uh, great rapidity. Uh, and so in the absence of ethical consensus, science will keep on advancing. All the more reason we need to have discussions like this one. And from my perspective, another thing to worry about then is what are we using as our international policy forum to try to achieve consensus across the world? It's hard enough within one country to decide where are the limits of what we're willing to do. How do we get to an international consensus? Do we need, as somebody said uh, during the course of the last couple of days, a Paris Accord meeting, not on climate change, but on where we're going uh, with biotechnology? Or would be that the biggest mistake imaginable because it would become all political and we ought to find other ways uh, to achieve consensus that doesn't involve the political apparatus. But we need to come up with a strategy there. Otherwise, uh, we will find ourselves the victims of the rogue actors who don't necessarily pay attention to consensus and for whom there are really no consequences of jumping out and crossing lines that we should not have crossed. The church can play a critical role, but the church must be well informed about rapid advances in science. But before I stop, again, mindful of the perils, let's also focus on the promise. You saw yesterday some remarkable examples. I'll show you one that you saw again, but with a little bit more story to it. This gene therapy for spinal muscular atrophy has become such a strong, encouraging experience for all of us who've been able to watch what's happened in the last uh, year or so. These are the floppy babies that you saw videos of yesterday. And through the work of Jerry Mandel and his colleagues at Nationwide, the ability to actually deliver to these children a virus that carries the missing gene that they need and that gets to the spinal cord, which is a very difficult place to get this, but even though it's injected intravenously, and I think you saw yesterday uh, this same video of little Mateo 
Remember, these are kids who are not ever going to even learn to sit up without treatment. And here he is at two and a half, not only sitting up, but walking, standing up on his tiptoes to hit that elevator button. Yeah, he's going off to work now. He's got stuff he's got to do. And look at this. Here he is on the monkey bars, holding on with his dad there to catch him. Uh, that, if that doesn't get to you, I don't know what will in terms of the promise that is now being realized. It's not just hope. It's hope that's based on action. It's something that's really happened. So I think going towards the future, we ought to be able to strike a balance for responsible innovation, to balance the promise and the perils, to bring hope to those who are suffering. That's an ethical imperative. The worst thing we could do is nothing. That would be a totally unethical position if we have the ability to reach out and help people. But we have to proceed responsibly. We have ethical principles that can guide us, and reasonable people can come together around reasonable solutions. In my office, up above my desk, uh, this is the painting that I look at every day. Uh, this is a wonderful painting that was sent to me by a 90-year-old artist in Harrisonburg, Virginia, who just thought it might be something I'd want to see. And the title of it is Jacob's Ladder. Those of you who know uh, the story of Jacob's Ladder from Genesis 28, uh, 10 through 19, uh, we'll know this is Jacob falling asleep and having this dream of a ladder going up to heaven and the angels going up and down on that ladder. And the uh, sense, therefore, created is that Jacob was being told of two things. One was inheritance of God's goodness and God's care, but also obligations. And I think of that whenever I look at this picture. We are, in fact, wonderfully fortunate uh, to have the inheritance that DNA carries with it uh, of who we are as a human species, but we also have the obligations uh, to take care of, of that very special gift and to make sure that it's being used in every possible way to help those who are still suffering and whose hope stands and, and rests upon uh, the expectation that we're going to utilize those gifts that God has given us to make progress. In that regard, I'll finish with this quote, the sciences and technologies are made for man and for the world, not the man and the world for science and technology. They are at the service of a dignified and healthy life for all now and in the future. The author, Pope Francis. Thank you all very much.